Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group Public um, Press Conference Webinar. Um, the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group is an independent group of scientists, medics, and all kinds of other people who are interested in helping Ireland take a science-based approach to getting out of the uh, current crisis with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Today we are addressing the topic of um, mandatory hotel quarantine, very um, topical at the moment. We have a guest speaker, Niall Conroy, who's a public health consultant working in Queensland in Australia, and he will be joining us later. We hope he's currently having some small technical difficulties, but we hope that he'll be able to join us very soon. But as usual, to start off, we're going to have a situation update where we can hear about the current case numbers and uh, patterns in Ireland. And James Merrick is going to give us that. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Aoife. If we could bring up the slides, please, Ben. That's great. So, um, yep. Yeah, so I'd like to uh, acknowledge Paul and um, various collaborators in the background that enables this um, rolling data analysis. So we'll, if we can go to the next slide, please, Ben, and we'll start with Northern Ireland this week again. And the different color, this is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. Um, the, the different, uh, and we're seeing um, daily, daily average cases per 100,000 people. Um, the different line colors represent different age groups. Um, you know, I think the big the big picture point here is that it's broadly trending um, down up to the right here. There are some bumps um, on the right hand side of the chart, um, but and there was clearly something happening around Easter with reduced testing. Um, so I, you know, the little upticks at the end and the bump before that, um, you know, something to keep an eye on, but but probably just an artifact of Easter. Um, so overall, and um, things are pretty good in Northern Ireland, and and. Um, they're beginning, some things are beginning to open up in the north now, so so um, you know we we'll be keeping an eye on how things progress. Um, so we, we move, with that we can move to the next slide and, and to the republic. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so the, let's start with the blue line, and this is healthcare workers, and we've we've talked about that before. Um, this group is by and large vaccinated, and so we're we're, we're seeing um, this um, the the low numbers there again. Maybe there's some Easter artifact. Um, at the, the bumps at the end, but but maybe the more important point here is the rest of the population, the vast majority, and that's the orange line. And and and, um, and we've fitted a, a trend line um, to to the to the to the curve, the orange curve, and uh, that helps us to show some inflection points. Um, and and so what we had the first little bump. Well, if you look in the middle of the chart around in early February was when asymptomatic. Uh, close contact testing began. We saw a bump of cases, uh, and then we saw this next inflection point where the line goes from a downward trend back to an increasing trend again, and was just, um, you know, that period uh, just after uh, that that period, a chunk of time after schools reopened, um, and then coming into and um, coming up to the Easter break again, we, we saw the an, another inflection point, and we're back on this downward trend again. Um, so the dotted line, say the first dotted line represents if we had stuck to the first trend and it had kept going down at that level, um, you know, there's a, if you add up the cumulative difference between those, the, the first dotted line and the, 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 the orange line at the top is like the 7,300 cases there that, that happened. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so overall, you know, we're back going the direction we want to be going um, in terms of getting life safe um, economic social health outcomes we want um and um, but but we have to hope we, we avoid the similar change of trajectory uh, in the next few weeks and um, if we go to the next slide please ben um yeah and so that as we've discussed before that increase in cases that change in trajectory was after the primary schools um particular uh, reopen and primary school age a uh, crest going crash age and primary school age was a big increase in um, cases um the blue and orange lines here represent children and and the green line represents kind of 15 and older um the whole school situation is could be another whole webinar um we can just point out that uh we know that B117 internationally has spread a lot, has been documented to spread a lot in classrooms, 
Uh, airborne transmission is a big factor, and, and we don't have many mitigation measures against airborne transmission in our primary schools at the moment. Um, so with schools reopening again this week, um, you know, of course, teachers are doing great work on the ground, buying their own personal CO2 monitors, um, opening windows, and doing what they can do uh, on an ad hoc basis. Whether that will be enough, um, well, well, we'll be keeping an eye on. So, um, uh, yeah, finally, I should say that there has been an alternative explanation put forward that this increase in cases was due to increased vigilance when schools reopened, that there was increased vigilance to symptoms. Um, you know, that's, that's, there's a lot of extra assumptions required for that to hold true. And um, yeah, so this will be debated and, and worked out in the academic setting in the meantime. Um, I think I think we need to do everything we can to, to prevent transmission in the classrooms. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Um, yeah, so I just want to quickly quickly drop a note on the um, regional cases, um, just to make the point that the blue line is southwest Cork and Kerry, green line is um, southeast Watford, Kilkenny, Wexford, Carlow, and and um, you know. Just to make the point that if if the whole country, the Republic, had followed the trend of um, the southeast, we would have a daily case load of seventy four at the moment. Um, so so you know there's a di divergence within the country, and some regions have have really been able to um, drive down um, the virus. Um, we'll move forward to, to the next slide, please, Ben, and the final slide. Um, is just to make a point, and there's a lot of stories happening internationally and kind of feeding into the webinar today. But you know, um, coming into the new year, we started seeing a drop in deaths worldwide with, with COVID. But for the last few weeks, it's been increasing again. Um, lots of different things. You know, on one side, de deaths have been dropping in the United States. On the other side, they've been increasing in Brazil. There's been a dramatic increase in India in the past couple of weeks. And um, also, sadly, in our, our neighbors, uh, European Union, um, we, we are still increasing. So that's, um, that's sort of global context we're in at the moment. So um, uh, that's the end of the situation update. And uh, we, can, we can end the presentation there. Thanks. Thank you, James. That's very useful and very informative, as always. I think it's, it's really important that we get these updates and we start to look at the trends and of course it's very good news that the the numbers are generally in decline this is what we all we all want to see so unfortunately now conroy is still having some technical problems and we're we're working in the background to try and fix that and hopefully he'll be able to join us uh, very shortly but before we do that um so i would like to encourage you actually to use the q a if you want to ask some questions um if, generally on the topic of um quarantine today, but if you have other questions, please bring them up. But um, before we get Niall back online, I'd like to ask uh, Gabriel Scali to please give us some comments. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Yes, given that we're talking about quarantine, I, I thought I would just outline why quarantine measures are absolutely necessary in, in Britain and Ireland at the present time. And I think there are, are several good reasons. First of all, uh, we know that the virus came to these islands through travel. That's how it got here. That's how all the variants have got here. That's how, for example, the, the Kent variant that has spread so much in England and been so much more infectious and also has produced more mortality, how it spread uh, to Ireland, for example, but also into a very large number of European countries and it's continuing to move across the globe because it's just so infectious. Um, and travel and the use of quarantine uh, to prevent travel has been a, uh, a public health measure going back centuries. And it has always been regarded as one of the most effective public health measures that any country or city or town or village could put in place to protect itself and to protect others. Uh, it is usually used to stop the ingress of uh, the importation of cases. It has also been used to stop the export of cases in, in some examples where uh, it's been possible to contain infection within a very small geographical area and, and ensure it wasn't exported. Uh, at the moment, there is a huge concern about variants. And the concern about the variants is that they do have some of the characteristics I mentioned. They can uh, spread more rapidly. They can cause more serious illness. But most importantly, and the reason why they 
are such a topic at the moment is this issue of their ability to dodge the immunity uh, that people have. Now, people get immunity to COVID-19 in two main ways. One is being infected, and that produces an antibody response, which varies with, with the age and other characteristics, but it does produce an antibody response. And uh, in, for many infectious diseases, that would be adequate to protect the person. But the COVID virus is such a, a dangerous virus because it has the ability to mutate and mutate quite quickly. So already we're starting to see people uh, who have been infected with COVID-19 with previous strains are now some, a very few number, but it is happening, are becoming infected with some of the variants. Similarly, we, there is an increasing uh, body of evidence from across the world that some of the variants that have developed, for example, in South Africa or in, in Brazil, uh, do mean that the level of effectiveness of the vaccines isn't as high as it uh, would be against the variants that were in general uh, distribution when, uh, when the vaccine was developed. And that is a real problem. Um, it's not something that we need to have an enormous panic about because at the moment it looks as if it was that vaccination will still protect people from, from death, but certainly there are increasing levels of infection and uh, symptomatic infection as well, and sometimes with uh, uh, problematic illness amongst people who have been vaccinated, but who have come into contact with some of these new dangerous variants. Um, there are small numbers of these variants popping up in various countries, and for most part, they've been kept under control, possibly because uh, although they have a characteristic of being able to, to dodge the uh, immune system to a certain extent, uh, they uh, do not, uh, they are not as infectious as, for example, the, the Kent variant is, so that they are not able to outcompete that particular variant of the, the virus, that strain of the virus, and uh, therefore are being restricted. And we've recently seen in the last day or two the emergence of a, a, a large cluster of cases, of over 70 cases of the South African variant in the London boroughs, South London boroughs of Lambeth and, and Wandsworth, and a very strong reaction being put in place by the uh, authorities to that. And, the, um, uh, and we must hope that that is keeping things under control, but that in essence is why quarantine is just so important, to stop the importation of variants, to keep us all safe and make sure that our vaccination programme can continue to be effective and protect us all. Thanks, Eva. Thank you, Gabriel. That's really very useful. And I see we have Niall and we've found an alternative connection to get to Niall now as well. That's great. But just before you finish up there, um, one question about that recent outbreak in the Lambeth area that you mentioned. Um, we've heard previously that the AstraZeneca vaccine is less effective. Um, so still does still helps, still does something, but less effective against the uh, the so-called South African variant, the B1351. Do you think that's um, connected to the fact, I mean, because you have quite a high coverage rate with vaccination, or is it just that uh, the vaccination hasn't really reached a sufficient level yet to um, to help in that case? Well, although it's 50% uh, vaccination rate, more or less, in the UK, uh, it has been in the older and vulnerable people, and they're not the people who are prime spreaders. Uh, if, if you look at who's spreading the, the disease, it is in younger age groups. And uh, I'm quite sure that those are the people who are being infected at okay. the moment, as we haven't had a, a detail yet, but that's certainly likely to be um, the people who've been affected by this one case of someone arriving, uh, not going through quarantine and bringing the variant with them. So we won't draw any conclusions just yet about how that can spread in a vaccinated population because it's probably not well, vaccinated. It, uh, not, not, from, not from the UK, but there are plenty of studies appearing now from around the world showing the ability of the, uh, the, uh, the variants to infect people and um, you know, ab ab absolutely quantifying the reduced effectiveness of some of the vaccines. And we need to be very much aware of those studies as they emerge from places like South Africa or Brazil, uh, where there are variants of, of concern. 
Okay, thank you, Gabriel. I think it's very interesting and constantly changing, very fast moving situation. And that's why these weekly updates are so important. So I'm really happy that now we can move over to um, Niall Conroy, who's a public health consultant in Queensland in Australia. And he um, is Irish by birth and um, he's living in Australia now and working there. And um, he's been really instrumental in the extraordinarily successful management of this pandemic in that part of the world where they are reaping the benefits of having had um, the quarantine and all of the other public health measures implemented very early and uh, very effectively. So Niall can tell us more about that now. Thank you very much for joining us, Niall. Thanks, Aoife, and um, sorry about the uh, technical glitches that we were um, we were having earlier on, but um, happy to be here now. Um, I just um, I, well, I, I would I would disagree that I've been instrumental in anything over here. I think I've been part of a a very good public health system, which I think is really the the important um, the important point. Um, I had a couple of slides, Aoife. Um, I've I'm disabled from allowing uh, from sharing my slides. Is there any way to um to, oh, yeah, there um, we go. There we go. Great. Perfect. Um I've got um I've been I've been given a very tight time frame. I've been told to take no more than sort of five to seven minutes. So I will uh do my best to um to get through it in that time. Um yeah, look, I think um Sorry, if I can. There we go. Um, I, look, I think we've been living with hotel quarantine over here for over a year, and I, you know, I, I think here and abroad, we, you know, hotel quarantine means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, um, I, you know, there there are people who look at the the police outside the hotels and they have real ideological um, problems with that, a real ideological opposition to, to that. You, you see some of the pictures there on the, the left as you're looking at it of some of the people in our hotel quarantine who are out on their balconies watching a musical performance, you know, which is one of the strategies we've had to sort of take away the boredom. And, and some of these people think hotel quarantine's been okay and they, 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 they've they they've been very happy to do it, on, you know, in the name of sort of controlling the virus. And then down the bottom of this slide, you have the, the headlines, the hotel hell sort of things that the, the media enjoy, the, the, the terrible food, um, all, these, all these kind of things, you know, that, um, you know, and I suppose the point I'm making is that hotel quarantine means different things to different people. And lots of people have different perceptions of it and different real experiences of it. And I think all of us would agree that hotel quarantine is a bad thing to have to do like it's not pleasant at all um you know but it's all just part of that risk benefit analysis isn't it you know you're doing a bad thing to to really give us in australia the quality of life that we have at the minute where i can go to a cinema or a bar or a restaurant and in my non-work day i don't have to think about um covid very much but i suppose the the um the reality here is in my next slide and i think you can see my slides okay um is is what we do, I suppose, in the practical sense. And it's not that different to Ireland um, outside of, I suppose, how comprehensive we are about it. And in Australia, before you get here, you've got to apply for permission to, to come into the country because there's only a certain amount of hotel quarantine rooms. And, you know, we have to sort of align um, airline arrivals with the number of rooms that we have. Um, but the, the process is broadly similar to what, you, what you've got back home. You know, you get off the plane, you get in a bus, um, you go to your, your hotel, uh, a legally binding quarantine order is issued to you and you go to your room and you're there for the next 14 days. You get tested at the beginning, you know, sort of day one or day two, and you get tested at the end. And um, interestingly here, if you test positive for COVID, you go to hospital um, to be managed there, even if you have no symptoms whatsoever. And that's just a way of, I, I suppose the thinking is, in hospitals, we have negative pressure rooms. We have staff who are, you know, very well trained in infection prevention and control. And um, so, you know, there's less chance of a leak um, out of a hospital environment into the community because that's really been the source of all of our COVID in, you know, since we got through our first peak. Um, it's all been leaks from hotel quarantine or leaks in hospitals. So we, we you know, so that, that's really our process. And we've had about a quarter of a million people through. Um, 
And somewhere in the region of about 1,500 to nearly 2,000, probably about 1,800 at this stage, have tested positive. And, you know, we're a, a zero COVID environment. And I, I think we could all agree that 1,800 um, cases being sort of let into the community would you know, with the exponential growth that we see would have resulted in us being as hard hit as as anywhere else, you know. And um, I think one of the key issues here is we have a sensible exemptions process. And I'm happy to take questions on that if people are interested. But I think part of the planning for this is that we established an exemptions unit for the whole COVID piece, not just for the hotel quarantine bit. Um, but for example, I, I see a lot of headlines at the moment from Ireland about people um, you know, sort of for, you know, really humanitarian reasons, looking for exemptions or looking to, to have a different form of quarantine applied. And we have a unit established in each state for that, that's really staffed by legal people and medical people who will work out, will talk to each other, and will talk to their local public health units about these really difficult cases and, and make sensible plans for these people, you know, so that we can we can do this. We can apply what's really a very difficult sort of intervention in a in, in as humanitarian way as is possible, though, though that's difficult broadly. Um, look, I think a, an important point to make is that people get very evangelical about interventions, whether it's hotel quarantine, masks, ventilation, antigen testing, whatever you're having yourself. Um, they're all part of, of a package. And I don't think you can suppress um, this virus to, to any manageable way without hotel quarantine. But having hotel quarantine won't mean automatically that you can suppress the virus. And I suppose, look, these two slides are just pictures of things that I, I think are just examples of things that happen well in Australia that don't happen well in Ireland. Ireland's broader public health response is you know internationally maybe not as, as good as other countries and the picture on the left is is a fever clinic and i suppose we take the view that hotel quarantine is about keeping cases out of the country so that the the, the cases that are here we can go ahead and hammer and, and really snuff out those transmission chains but to do that you have to sort of aggressively find cases so we've taken the approach right from the start that you can just turn up seven days a week to a, what we call a fever clinic for any reason you want and get swabbed for um, for COVID and have a result the next day. That's one of the one example of the type of things that you have to do alongside um, alongside hotel quarantine. And the other slide on the right is one of our public health teams, a happy, well resourced bunch. The public health units in Ireland are on their knees and were so before the um, the, the, the pandemic and. You can't get a public health doctor in Ireland for love nor money because they get treated so badly. And Ireland hasn't hired a single consultant in public health medicine. So I suppose the point I'm making is look at hotel quarantine in its place. It's really, really important, but it's part of a broader suite of public health measures. This is the quickest slide I've ever had. Who goes into quarantine here? Everyone um, except New Zealand. So we've established a travel bubble with them. And ultimately, the aim would be as countries get to sort of very, very low levels of COVID to hopefully um, establish some more travel bubbles. And some of the key issues here that people might want to ask about is who supports quarantine? Um, first group here I have is police, military and security. And I've seen a lot of people get really sort of focused on, you know, do we use police, do we use private security? It doesn't matter as long as they are not a transient workforce that they can take sick leave and that they're very well trained in infection prevention and control you need police sometimes but you know a lot of the models in australia would revolve around sort of private security firms backed up by the police if needed you need um you need doctors and nurses to be available because people in hotel quarantine get sick with um non-covid related things and they get sick with covid so you know that there you can't just sort of you know, because you can't just leave your room um, unless it's a sort of a kind of an emergency where you call an ambulance, you need to have medical support available to these people. And you need to have mental health support available to these people. Uh, staring at the walls for 14 days really gets to some folk, as you can imagine, and you need mental health support. We have mental health nurses. We have 24-hour telephone counselling. All that kind of stuff is really, really important or people really struggle to comply. We have a big logistics and operations sort of centre um, so each group of hotels or each region in each city would have a sort of a health emergency operation center who coordinate all this stuff 
between doctors, police, you know, they'll they'll coordinate things like regular um, salivary testing of hotel quarantine staff. They'll give me a call if I'm on call for public health about a potential breach, you know, of quarantine, things like that. You need you need people who can who can coordinate all this. So it's not just about police and military, which I think get a lot of the um, the, the the sort of the, the headlines. I, I think you need a 24 hour support team to manage these hotel quarantines, especially as your numbers get bigger. And then you need your exemption teams. And I spoke about them earlier on. So look, um, that was the very, very quick run through that I was asked to do. Um, th- there's, there's a huge amount of detail in what we do. And um, it's been a year of you know, it's not all been plain sailing. We've done a lot of learning. Um, but I think at this stage, we probably recognize what you need and what's important and what the priorities are. Um, but, you know, the take home messages, it's worked really well. And um, we, you know, we, we don't have COVID. And look, I would give my right arm for hotel quarantine to stop. I haven't seen my family in Ireland, you know, in nearly a year and a half. I have a new baby who hasn't met his grandparents you know, because we, we can't just leave the country and come back. Um, it, it's not it's not pleasant, um, but it works really well. But it has to be part of a broader suite of public health measures. And I think that's really important. So I'll, I'll stop talking now and either let somebody else um, add in some sense and um, or take some questions. Wh- whatever works, Eva. Yeah. Thank you, Niall. That's very useful, quick uh, run through everything. And I think it's important that you talk about there are those exemptions on compassionate grounds because that has been the discussion in Ireland in the last week has been talking about, you know, compassionate cases or various cases like this and how they're dealt with. And we didn't have a system in place. And so these, so essentially this means the the whole uh, quarantine system is being challenged fundamentally rather than, uh, you know, a request mm. being made because there's no mechanism to make a request on on compassionate grounds. I thought it was interesting what you said, you know, so at the beginning, you know, you were downplaying your own role, saying, you know, you're part of a big system. And you mentioned that there are a lot of structures there, um, the fever clinics, um, the the rapid testing, how you have the various security personnel in quarantine well-trained. How much of that was in place a year ago or a year and a bit ago? And how much did you have to quickly assemble and quickly mobilize um, you know, in response to the situation? Yeah, we, we had to do it all, but I suppose the framework for thinking about it was there. Uh, Australia has been very good at planning for pandemics. And, you know, the, there's a big chasm between countries that have done that and haven't done that. And Australia has had, from the beginning, a sophisticated pandemic planning um, sort of infrastructure, which gets tested um, you know, either in the real world or, you know, in simulation every every year, really, you know. And so I suppose you, in no world would anybody plan a pandemic and not plan for the idea or not think about the idea of mass quarantine. So that was always on the radar. But, you know, the reality is, um, you know, very few plans survive first contact, as they say in the military. And, you know, there was there was a lot of um, scrambling at the beginning to get these processes in place. So our quarantine initially, you know, looks different than it than it does now. So I would say the framework, the thinking was done in advance. But look, it's and as you're seeing in Ireland, these things throw up all sorts of issues that you know you would never that that you would never imagine and um i I think actually that the whole world of the the exemptions was probably the biggest learning process and we got that rolling fairly quickly but I, i think it's important to point out i think when you're talking about exemptions it's not a case like ultimately quarantine here is is really strict so you're not going to get an exemption from quarantine that's not the kind of thing that happens the kind of thing that happens is somebody has a really, really strong humanitarian reason for saying goodbye to a dying relative or something like that, but they'll still have to go into hotel quarantine. And then what will happen is that the exemptions team will call me and say, Niall, there's, there's someone who wants to visit their dying father in your area, you know, so it's in my, my patch as the director of public health and, and the public health consultant for that region. And they'll sit down with me someone from the hospital who's looking after this patient, 
you know, and, and we, we'll, we'll have a chat. We, we'll come up with something like this person can leave for a few hours each day and um, we'll, we'll get them a, a car to drive there themselves. They'll have to have a test, you know, um, before they leave the, the hospital each or before they leave the hotel each day. And um, they'll have to go into the room in full PPE, you know, and they can stay for a couple of hours and they'll have to go back to the hotel and do it all again the next day. That, that is not a pleasant experience for anybody, but it's, it's the kind of solutions we work out with people. And, you know, so you're, you're, you're not going to get a sort of a, okay, you have a humanitarian reason, you don't have to do quarantine. You'll get a managed solution, which aims to absolutely minimize the risk, which will mean you get extra testing, you know, and you'll be sort of brought into the hospital at a quiet time through an entrance that nobody else is using, all, all these type of things that, you know, as, as humans, we're, we're good at finding pragmatic solutions. They're not ideal, but they're, they're certainly really helpful for people who just need those precious moments with, with a loved one. Um, there's a few questions coming in. So one question is um, who pays and how much does it cost for the quarantine in, in Australia? And another one is that is kind of the, the strategy for the future is that, that um, when all Australians or the majority are vaccinated or all eligible Australians are vaccinated, then it would be that um, people can come in given they are also vaccinated or what's the strategy for the future? So the first thing about the cost was what, what happened was there was essentially a call put out um, that gave Australians a period of time that said, I can't remember exactly when it was, but sort of said, look, if you're if you're if you haven't booked a ticket by May or something, I think it was of last year, you're going to have to pay for your own room. So if you had made a booking before then, um, it's free. So then what happens is if you if you, if you make a booking today, you'll have to pay about um, probably about 1500 euro um thereabouts um for your quarantine but there's um you don't have to pay in advance so what happens is you turn up you go into quarantine and then they send you a bill and afterwards like if you're a pensioner you know if you, if you don't have the means to pay for it you just apply for an exemption and i i gather quite a lot of those have been have been granted so um you don't have to have the money to do hotel quarantine in advance. You can apply retrospectively and, you know, I think you, you can pay in installments and that kind of thing. But um, up to a certain point, they, they gave people notice that you would have to pay afterwards because it was costing a huge amount of money um, to, to, to give free hotel quarantine, essentially. But the key is nobody has to have that money in advance. Mm -hmm. It's costing us and a huge I amount of money not to have it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that was really, really the thinking um, when it first came in. The question about what's the plan for the long term, I, I, I had a, a colleague give a really good answer to a question like this the other day who said, um, I don't know, I'm not a politician. You, you know, like the, the answers to these questions are not always public health. They're, you know, there's a huge political input into them. And I think, um, you know, th there's a lot of pressure to open the borders here, as you can imagine. And um, I, I suspect the thinking in public health broadly, I suppose, is you open the borders when letting in a lot of cases is unlikely to lead to lots of lockdowns and restrictions or hospitalizations or deaths. And, you know, I would I would imagine that once the adult population are immunized um, or everyone in the adult population has been offered um, a vaccination and had the chance to have that vaccination, that there will be a graded um, reopening. I, I think because what we're in this sort of data black hole, you know, nobody has done this before. The danger is to sort of, you know, just say, right, it's done, open the doors and, you know, and something goes wrong. Um, so I, I think it's going to be the kind of thing that, you know, you get in, if you have a vaccine, then you'll get in, you know, after that one, if that's going okay, the vaccine or you've recovered from COVID or you have a vaccine recovered from COVID and you've done a PCR test within two days of flying, you know, and, and I think it, the key to reopening will be vaccinating the population and a staggered measured reopening and see see what happens and i think that's that's going to be the key anyone who throws open the borders too quick and um, could end up could end up in trouble just being that nobody's done this before yeah. 
Yeah. And you have like a very precious situation that's worth protecting. You know, here, for example, I mean, you, you probably know this already, but even partners can't attend antenatal appointments or the births. Um, sometimes, you know, people can't attend funerals. All of these um, ordinary, very like these, these things that we would like people to be able to do on compassionate grounds aren't happening even within the country, no less uh, for people arriving into quarantine. Um, there's a question Gabriel Scali would like to ask you. So I'll allow... Um, I'll get Gabriel to ask you himself. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for all your great work during the pandemic. It's been inspirational stuff, and it's it's great that you've uh, been so active in social media and letting people know what's going on. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, uh, what, in fact, one of the noticeable things about this pandemic is the number of Irish doctors that have popped up uh, all over the place from, uh, uh, you know, Mike Ryan at WHO, Yvonne Doyle in, in London. And I think you hinted at one of the problems early uh, in when you were talking that uh, public health doctors aren't properly recognized and resourced in, in Ireland, which uh, I think is absolutely true. How would you contrast the resources you have available to you and your colleagues uh, with what you know to be available to the directors of public health, for example, uh, in Ireland? Yeah, look, um, that's, that, that's a really good question. and gets to the crux of, of a lot of what's going on back home. Um, the for, for those who for those who aren't aware um there's a bizarre situation in ireland where um you know public health medicine um for for many many years um decades actually has been under resourced and um i i think primarily because it was it, it was a predominantly female specialty and it's the only specialty in medicine where you finish higher specialist training and you aren't given a consultant contract the media frequently paint this as a pay issue but it's not it's an authority and it's an autonomy issue so i left ireland for that reason actually because i could get a consultant contract in australia and not for the money but it's it's looking at if you're a public health physician in ireland you don't have a team assigned to you whereas i have a team of 16 people and um, if you're a public health physician in ireland you don't sit at the top table. Um, and whereas nothing happens in my region without me sitting at the table. And in fact, I'm the first person everybody goes to. I manage outbreaks for a living. And that's recognized that the hospital group have hired me to manage outbreaks. And, um, you know, I, I'm the person with the expertise locally. So it, it's not just the resourcing in terms of the team, it's the seat at the top table you know, to make decisions. And it's that sort of that, that respect in Ireland, you're, you're different to other doctors, you're, you're not worthy of being a consultant. So you're, you're different. And, and that's, that's kind of hard sometimes to quantify how that, how that feels and works in, in, in the real world, but you're different to other doctors. So yet yeah, loads more resourcing, loads more authority, if I need to do something, if I need to close somewhere down, or if I need, you know, to take drastic action in a prison or a shelter or something, you know, I have to, of course, answer to the, the medical regulator, but I'm I, I'm given that authority. So it's really, to, to my mind, aside from the size of my team and um, the, the sort of the resources that are given to me, um, it's that authority and that autonomy. To give you an example, I, I showed you some pictures of the, the testing clinic. So if I have, and we, we had a first wave like everyone else, if I saw an outbreak happening in a part of town that I was worried about, I literally picked up the phone and I said, we need a pop-up clinic tomorrow to do community testing there at 9 a.m. And the hospital group did it every single solitary time, um, supplied redirected nurses from the hospital, and it was up and running within 12 hours. You know, I can, I can go in and test a nursing home within probably six hours. I can have every single solitary person tested. So it is, look, this has been an ongoing issue and it's why Ireland cannot get a public health physician and I believe has hired no extra public health physicians during the pandemic which I mean where where are you going to go with that you know Thank you. thanks very much Niall thank you okay yeah, it is. It is extraordinary that a year into a public health crisis, it's still the public health doctors that are needing to haggle for uh, resources. You think they'll be throwing the resources at them. Um, Professor Jerry Colleen also wanted to um, make a, a comment and maybe ask a question. Yeah, no, it's um, first of all, thanks so much for sharing your expertise. I've learned a lot already today. You know, 
assuming that, that things go well and we can all be optimistic, even with the vaccines that we have, which are based on single antigen. So let's say all goes well and we don't go, go through that, that cautious reopening that you've mentioned, which I agree with. I guess one of your points would be that we would still need to have like real kind of A team, public health teams on standby for at least a couple of years, just in case something goes wrong. And therefore that even with the vaccine rollout, these issues of fixing systematic problems in our public health cadre and infrastructure and, and systems, it's not yesterday's issue. It becomes even more relevant, you know, even if we move into better times. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important point is that we need to be spring loaded for the next few years because whatever happens, we're not going, what, however successful the, the vaccines are, um, when we reopen, not everyone will be vaccinated or for whatever reason, not everybody will be protected. Um, you know, sadly, that, that sort of lack of vaccination um, tends to be in a lot of our poorer you know, more crowded or crowded or people living in poorer, overcrowded conditions. And I, I think everyone feels that the, the face of COVID after the sort of the reopening will not be this sort of relentless high case numbers that, that you're seeing every day. It'll be explosive outbreaks in probably underserved and um, deprived communities, which we were seeing as little parts of the first wave you know you could look at your first wave and everyone paints these as sort of these you know sort of normal wave shaping but within them there was all these outbreaks and they were they were almost they were almost all in very deprived settings or very vulnerable settings so yeah we we're not planning on standing down anytime soon so when when you're all uh when everything's opened up and everyone's uh, back enjoying their pints and their dinners spare a thought for us will be uh, spring loaded, ready to uh, ready to go. You're absolutely right, Chair. So there's um, there's a question that has come in, which is uh, to do with um, the whether a vaccinated person should also be required to attend to quarantine in the current circumstances. In the future, we've described a future where it could be different, but in the current circumstances, because we've had these queries in Ireland in the last week or so. Um, Isle or anybody else on the panel might like to to answer that question. From from our perspective in Australia, and I, I won't monopolise the conversation too much. If anyone else wants to jump in, from our perspective in Australia, we would, I suppose, it's about what you're what you think in your the point of your hotel quarantine is sort of relates to this. In Australia, we're doing hotel quarantine to achieve no community transmission of COVID. In Ireland, I'm not really sure what what they're doing it for because you know it's 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 not every country and it's you know it, it, there's no stated aim to stop community transmission. But if you're going to stop community transmission, then you have a much sort of um, higher threshold to let somebody in to the country. And we know that people who are vaccinated, two things can happen: a they can still get sick on occasion. The vaccines are very very good and stop you know most people getting sick but the, you know, no vaccine stops everybody getting sick so you know you would still quarantine people to see if they become unwell even though their, their chances are low and um, there are also people who are vaccinated who can carry the virus and even though they're not sick they can pass it on and um, they're unlikely to be a source of mass transmission you know, you, you you transmit this thing when you've got a high viral load and you've no symptoms, but people who are vaccinated tend to have a lower viral load and they don't cough and sneeze and all that kind of stuff, but they can still certainly pass it on. If you're doing hotel quarantine in Ireland, which I suspect is they're just trying to reduce the number of variants getting in and to maybe reduce the number of cases, maybe there's a stronger argument, but certainly in a world where, to, to my mind, the reason for hotel quarantine is to stop cases coming in so that your public health teams can deal with all with what's already there and i would have fairly um uh, until we understand the full extent of the potential for vaccinated people to transmit i, I think the precautionary principle applies and i i wouldn't um i wouldn't be in favor of 
um, allowing people who are vaccinated at the moment to avoid quarantine. If you were doing it, I would add in as much checks and balances as you can. You know, for example, um, a test two days before you come. You know, there's all sorts of things, a, a, a symptom screen on arrival, all that kind of thing. But I, I still think while we're in that sort of um, world where we, we feel that people who are vaccinated may still transmit virus, albeit not at a level that that unvaccinated sick people would, I think it's um it's probably a bit of a risk. But happy to um put that out for dissenting views amongst the panel. I think Ivan Ivan Perry wanted to comment. Hi, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to uh, pick up on the the, the uh, comment that Niall was making on the extent to which we need we need we need strong uh, public health teams into the future because of course as as, as well as dealing with the with um, outbreaks, uh, the other public health issues that that we we, we have to d d deal with won't have won't have uh, gone away. So we will we'll still be as we are now dealing with pandemic levels of overweight and and obesity, substance substance um, misuse, uh, um, epidemics of. <laughs> Mental, mental dis, 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 in young people, and we've got the um, climate emergency c coming to, c coming down the the the, uh, the track. So in, in a way, the 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 pandemic that we're 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 currently going through is really a wake up call to develop our our uh, public health systems, both both um, nationally and. Globally, and um, un unfortunately, there's, there's 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 really no sign at the moment that in in Ireland we're t taking that message on board. Have we lost Eva? So yes, we've lost we've lost Eva. Um, so just bringing those two points together, um, it, it seems you know if, when, when we get to the point where we can let vaccinated people in, a con condition is to have public health teams so that if, if people um, do slip through and um, vaccination, and and and, and <clears throat> if the virus does come in, and um, we need a public health teams to 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 act as as Niall and Ivan. Be there and equipped to 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 deal with it as Niall and Ivan articulated. Um, so I I don't yeah so I don't have the full access to all the questions of the panelists, but maybe I'll um, hand over to Anthony Staines if he's available. Um, or yeah, Niall, do you have a point? Yeah. No, I I think Jer was looking to yeah. uh, make a very valid oh, point yeah, about yeah. Yeah. coming in. Sure. Thanks, Niall. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's just about, um, I guess, some of the diseases I work with are epidemic and some are endemic. And the endemic ones you manage similarly to the way that you manage non-communicable diseases. You know, the risks are fairly static. But with something that's epidemic, the issue is that the risk grows. It's not a static entity. And so the rules of the game change. When you're working on disease control, or in fact, you know, infectious disease control, you're often focusing on the average or the majority. But when you're dealing with something that's epidemic, the exceptions become hugely important. So, you know, even if 99 people coming through an airport and were vaccinated never transmit to anybody, if you get one person who comes in and is carrying that really unpleasant variant, the consequences of that are much, much bigger than they would be with, say, a chemical hazard or, um, or I'd say a terrorist threat or anything like that. So the way that we manage these kinds of risks are very, very different to the way that we manage regular risks and regular diseases. And that's where I think, you know, people need to keep an eye on the difference between a vaccine that can control onward transmission and a vaccine that can eliminate. Could I ask Niall uh, a question since we have you? Uh, Niall, apart from uh, the quarantine, which is really, really important. Going forward, is there much happening about uh, environmental changes, changes to ventilation, uh, changes to you know, the amount of space that people have, 
uh, that sort of stuff, because although everyone, I think, understands the importance of ventilation, we haven't seen programs improving it in workplaces, in schools, and so on, uh, that certainly I think should be a place. Uh, what's the situation on those sort of uh, uh, measures in Australia? Um, I, I suppose Australia was reasonably well prepared already, like, for example, our hospitals. So most new hospitals that are built after SARS-1 um, had a sort of a whole sort of different ventilation system than hospitals built before that time. So hospitals really built since then were full of single rooms that and lots and lots of negative pressure rooms and separate ventilation systems. So within the hospital setting, um, that, that, that's been done um, a long time ago, fairly early on um, in some states in Australia. They, they sort of did a lot of um, analysis of pressure within the rooms of, ho of hotels and sort of tweaked the ventilation to that extent. But outside of that, I would say um, probably there's not been a great deal done. I, I think that's the part of it that is assumed um, probably not correctly to be the more expensive bit and requiring all that sort of infrastructural stuff. But in, in Australia, because of the, the temperature in most parts of the country anyway, we just have that places are built to, to allow air in. Um, you know, our houses tend to be much better ventilated anyway. So I, I think there's a feeling that, um, that we're okay. But look, I, I think it's definitely a, a lesson to be learned um, in the context of a, of a whole suite of, of interventions. And I, I don't think, I don't think anywhere has really dealt with the ventilation issue at, at scale in, in the way they probably need to do. Thanks. Eva. Was there? So Aoife is still coming back in. Um, I, I just like to make one comment on the vaccine situation with respect to um, whether we quarantine people. There's a lot of confusion at the moment on this uh, particular issue in Ireland right now. Uh, part of it is a misunderstanding uh, about how much vaccines can reduce transmission. And part of it is what kind of policy are we actually engaging in? Um, it is the case that Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have a very substantial effect in reducing both infection and transmission, as the US CDC have pointed out. And this will effectively reduce, hopefully, about 80 to 90% of onward transmission from the subset of the population that are vaccinated. Uh, not all vaccines are going to have the same level of efficacy there. Uh, AstraZeneca is unlikely to have that degree of efficacy in stopping transmission. And, and we don't know about, uh, I, as far as I understand it, we don't know about Johnson & Johnson. So we have a situation where if you're considering population health, um, it's, it's different when you're considering what's happening in a social environment in the country than if you're concerned with mandatory quarantine. So if you're considering whether 10 or 100 people can gather together, if those people have been vaccinated and the vaccines reduce transmission, then of course that will reduce the risk and that will change how we can manage things. Uh, but that's not the same thing as, as Jerry Green pointed out, as preventing new cases from coming into the country because a subset of the vaccinated people, even with uh, the best vaccines will still transmit, uh, will still potentially transmit the virus. Now on the, on the topic of whether uh, the policy is to live with the virus or to eliminate the virus, uh, this also changes the rationale. So uh, if we're to take an elimination approach, if we were to take an elimination approach, uh, mandatory hotel quarantine would be there to prevent the introduction of all new variants into the community. That is not the current government strategy. Uh, the current government strategy is for vaccine, is for mandatory hotel quarantine to prevent the introduction of new variants into the country. The motivation for this mm -hmm. is the fear that new variants will emerge that have a degree of vaccine resistance, which will slow down the vaccination program. 
And if the goal is to prevent the introduction of vaccine resistant variants, then there is no sense in allowing people who have been vaccinated to skip quarantine. Because of course, if there are vaccine resistant variants out there are becoming or, or evolving, then they can be transmitted by people who have been vaccinated. So uh, whether or not we have an elimination policy to reduce COVID cases in general, or whether we have uh, a policy which is geared at preventing new variants from coming into the country, uh, in either case, it doesn't really make sense uh, to allow vaccinated people to, to skip quarantine um, according to current knowledge. And it, with the caveat that our knowledge about all vaccines is still in an early stage and we don't, uh, and we're learning new things all the time. So that story, of course, may change. Thanks, Tomas. And uh, sorry for my technical issues. I dropped out of the call there for a while, but uh, you're all pros and you managed without me. Um, <laughs> is there anybody else? We're getting close to the hour now. And I'm just wondering, is there anybody else um, who would like to make a comment from the panel? Anybody else who'd like to add some points or raise a question? Because we could... Uh... Perhaps I could... Terry. Or, yeah. or Andrew, maybe Andrew. I think Andrew's queued up first. Okay, I can't see raised hands. Just I, I uh, had to quit Zoom. It seemed to be causing me problems. So, so just speak. Okay, up. well, maybe, maybe I'll just comment briefly then. Um, there was a question from Nessa Childers about, um, about, you know, how much, how difficult we can expect variants to be going forward. You know, and there's good news and there's bad news. The, the, the bad news is that, um, COVID is a, a little bit more immunologically slippery than we'd like. It's certainly in the, it's, it, it is in the class of immunologically slippery pathogens. But the good news is it's nowhere near that kind of Olympic level that we see in, for example, the big three infectious diseases globally. You know, you never become fully immune to malaria. You never become fully immune to HIV, and you never become fully immune to TB. You know, those are diseases with non-sterilizing immunity. And then you have viruses that, you know, you're, can even in, induce immune responses that make you more vulnerable to the next strain that you're exposed to. But COVID isn't like that. So it does have, it is able to change its genome. It's not at a super high rate. And so I'm really optimistic that if we do get multivalent vaccines against multiple antigens, you know, so that basically the, the principle is if the left doesn't get you the right will, and so those vaccines should make us robust against variants at the kind of levels of genomic reorganization that we see in COVID. So I'm really, really optimistic about 2022, 2023, but in the meantime, we've got to make do our best with uh, what we've got. So what you're talking about there are what people call the second generation vaccines. So at the moment, our vaccines are providing your body's immune system information about the single protein on the, the virus, which is the spike protein. And the idea is that these next generation, second generation vaccines will be providing more than one target. So if one of them changes, then the other one should still be hopefully caught by the, you know, so you'll have antibodies against multiple sites on the on the virus so even if one of them changes you should still be protected so that's a, that's a bigger step up in than um we, we can modify the current vaccines to recognize a slightly changed spike but what you're talking about is, is another step again which is which be a very important step forward as well um are there any other comments was it andrew who wanted to say something Yep, so we just had a question from Kevin Finn about at what age should the HSE stop mass vaccinations because it's a suggestion that some people are minimally affected. And I just wanted to comment that unfortunately... The younger age is the question. Yes, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be people who are minimally affected. There are people who are fortunate enough to have milder cases or asymptomatic cases, but there are still a lot of young people who do end up in the hospital. And we're seeing that situation get worse across the world. There are a lot of people in Brazil 
it's believed that a large proportion of the ICU population is aged under 40. And just from anecdotal experience from friends, I've had friends younger than me and much healthier than me who have described that they felt like they were going to die when they've become infected. So it's, there's, unfortunately, vaccination will be important for all age groups, probably. I mean, in children, the tests are ongoing at the minute, but I would urge even young adults who may feel invincible to seek vaccination where possible. And um, it is also true. So what you say is absolutely true, but it's also true that in some of the younger age groups, the importance may be in what, how the vaccination affects transmission, which we do hope that the vaccines are going to have a significant impact on transition and bring us, you know, bring the numbers down. And so because, as was mentioned earlier by Gabriel, younger age groups are typically more involved in transmission because they're socializing more and doing more uh, things outside their house, um, that it's, that's an important age group to vaccinate as well. Um, I know Anthony Staines previously made comment that this is not strange in terms of vaccination programs, that part of the value of the vaccination program is the, the protection it gives to the population. And I remember when he gave the example of measles, how the group most at risk of death with measles are younger than one year old, but they are not eligible for the vaccine. So we vaccinate everybody else in order to protect that most at risk group. Older children can suffer death, unfortunately, as well, but the worst affected group is one that cannot receive the vaccine. Um, are there any other um, comments or questions? Anybody else who'd like to jump in? I can't see you, so just jump in if you want to. Aoife, just on that uh, question about the age, I, and uh, let me say it again, this is a, a personal view of mine, but I'm against uh, letting anyone get infected with this dangerous virus. We don't know the natural history of the virus and we don't know how it's going to change. And uh, I, I remember from my public health training, uh, which wasn't today nor yesterday, but I do remember some of it, and uh, being told about the aftermath of the pandemic flu in 1918, 1919, and the upsurge of Parkinson's disease cases that were associated with that in the United States afterwards. Um, now, they didn't have a, a mechanism of definitively proving it at that time, but we do know that this virus is very active in the brain. And I am uh, very much opposed to any notion that we would, uh, you know, willfully let children be infected with a, a virus that we don't know half uh, enough about to even consider such a thing. Uh, so uh, as long as there is a safe vaccine, as Andrew said, the trials are ongoing about uh, uh, with the vaccines in younger people. Uh, we, we should try and protect everyone from this virus for the time being. Yeah, and it is, it is a, a classic case of a preventable disease. So we should do everything to prevent it. And the vaccines are a huge, huge, hugely important part of that. So um, unless anybody else wants to join in with a comment, and um, we've just gone over the hour. So I think um, we've had a We've had a good uh, session. I want to once again thank Niall Conroy. We're very grateful right. for his time. Sorry, oh, Aoife. Jerry. Yeah, okay. Sorry, Aoife. No, I'm just saying that because I know you can't see the chat. Uh, there yeah. was a question from Marissa Fagan about um, the pre-booking and the, and the planning. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and how you stream uh, pa incoming passengers into um, into Mandry Hotel quarantine. So maybe maybe Niall could answer that one if, if we so, have a couple So the minutes. question was, um, I think I saw it earlier before I lost my connection. The question was, um, seeing as we have what they're calling walk-ins, you know, these people who aren't booked in, but um, they're then required to quarantine. Does this suggest um, problems in our implementation or, you know, and, and the fact that our, we're also um, full already, apparently um, two weeks in, what does this suggest about the implementation of uh, hotel quarantine here in Ireland? Yeah, I suppose the issue around pre-booking is is really important, and um, it's it's difficult to 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 get on top of it. But you know, having having walk-ins in a in somewhere like the EU is probably. A bit harder to avoid than it is in somewhere like Australia. 
Um, but the, the point of a hotel quarantine is you always have to operate at beyond what, what you think your capacity is because you can have fairly sudden problems with the, well, I'm talking from an Australian perspective, like if air, air conditioning in a whole floor or two floors packs in, you know, we can't just leave all these people who've come from overseas um, and who may be, you know, incubating the virus just with, with nowhere to go. So you you have to have spare capacity. It, 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 it's like the whole hospital thing again, isn't it? You know, we, we try and run hospitals at 99, 100% capacity and we're not ready for, for problems or surges. Hotel quarantine, you need to look at it like that too. You need to always think, what if I lose three floors of hotel rooms tomorrow? What What can I do here? And so you do your best to anticipate arrivals in Australia, that's much easier because um, people are, you know, on long haul flights. Um, but the key, the key people to be involved in that is the airlines. You won't get on a flight to Australia unless you've arranged um, hotel quarantine. That, that's just as simple. There's no airline. So Australia has a, a set of approved airlines who are allowed to come into the country at the minute. And, and to be honest with you, most airlines are on it. And part of that process is that they have to do that pre-arrival checking. So we, we, we don't really get walk-ins, but we get other problems with hotel quarantine. And you have to, you, you cannot work at 99 or 100% capacity. You just can't, or it'll, that'll come back to bite you. Yeah. Thanks, Niall. So I've been sent now the questions that I couldn't see. My, my Zoom failed. Um, so there's a question from Mike McKillen asking, in Australia, um, what have you done with schools regarding ventilation? Or was it necessary? You know, um, it is necessary here uh, because we still have high cases in the community. But have you done, um, have, you, have there been any remedial measures looking at ventilation in schools? Um, no, not, not that I'm aware of, but, but school classrooms here I deal with a lot of school-based outbreaks in my non-COVID outbreak um, role, um, and they're, they're very well ventilated because of the heat. You know, they work with doors open, windows open all the time. Not to say they couldn't benefit from, you know, from a, a ventilation review, but it's it's not the world that we know. Where we all grew up in Ireland of, you know, steamed up windows on a, on a freezing day, all sort of locked in, in this box. Lots of learning happens outdoors, certainly here in Queensland, you know, probably a bit less vulnerable in that space than, than you are in Ireland. But, you know, you, you can always improve, but I'm not, not aware yeah. that that's happened. Yeah, I suppose the, the, the different cases in the community also change how, how risky yeah. it is as well. Um, there's a question yeah. which I think is not really for Niall, um, it's, it's asking, in terms of this um, quarantine discussion, how do we deal with cases coming across the border? And I suppose that's where the consistency with the quarantine regime that's currently in the UK maybe is uh, relevant because they do have um, a quarantine uh, system in the UK. Maybe, Gabriel, is this something that you could talk about? Uh, very reluctantly because it's not a very good system. And uh, as far as I'm aware, there is no quarantine system actually in Northern Ireland uh, in place. Uh, I'm open to correction on that and Helen might know, but I don't think there is. Um, so it, it isn't being done well. And the difficulty is, and I keep arguing at this point that you can't, you can't have half a quarantine. You either have quarantine or you don't. You can't have it. And uh, the people who are wanting to travel are well enough first to be able to uh, change their travel arrangements or uh, fly via different places and uh, not have through ticketing and so on. That it uh, uh, that it becomes a nonsense really not to do it to do it properly. And it's uh, extremely disappointing that we see, for example, an outbreak of the South African variant in 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 London now. Uh, that that was on that's unnecessary, absolutely unnecessary. Uh, so uh, the situation in Northern Ireland. And, uh, and of course, we know well that people are likely to fly to Belfast um, and travel into the south uh, under normal circumstances, plenty do. Uh, but uh, under the current circumstances, it is really one of those issues that should be dealt with under the Memorandum of Understanding between the Republic and Northern Ireland and, and isn't being dealt with. In fact, nothing is being dealt with under that Memorandum of Understanding that I, I can see. 
and there should be one unified quarantine system for the whole island. That's what makes that ma what makes perfect sense. Uh, it was managed in 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 the Ireland of 1800. They uh, enacted a quarantine act very swiftly uh, across the whole island and uh, did a, an excellent job in keeping the, the, the plague out of Ireland. And uh, it's amazing, two centuries later, we cannot, we just can't do the job of quarantine mm -hmm. um, uh, and, 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 and don't really seem to make, want to make an attempt to. So it's very disappointing, I think, particularly for all those people uh, who, have, who have put such effort into uh, into trying to keep us safe in all sorts of other ways. Yeah, and we've seen, I mean, we've seen the consequences. We've had such a huge amount of, um, of death and suffering unnecessarily, which is, is really, really awful. There's a question about um, the, there's a focus at the moment, people are asking the question whether the mandatory hotel quarantine is somehow disproportionate and how it affects the, the right to liberty of uh, the individuals traveling and how that should be weighed up against the rights to liberty of the people in the country in the sense, of, in the sense that there's so many things that we can't do um, because of the, the public health failures. Um, in, is there anybody who'd like to, to talk about that? Um, Simon, is that you? As our, yeah, our human I rights lawyer. I yeah, so I, I suppose this question has been uh, written about in our, our newspapers, Niall. I, I'm not sure if you were aware of this argument that the even the deprivation of liberty for two weeks in a hotel for one incoming traveller uh, is a disproportionate measure. Um, and when we have that conversation, the protection of the right to life and liberty of Irish resident people doesn't enter it. It's seen as something absolute. Could you, uh, it's, it's, it's probably difficult for you to describe because people are no longer in lockdown in Australia and you live very normal lives, but to see that these measures are not ideologically set against each other, but all aimed at a virus that doesn't care for our ideas about rights and seen in a, in a larger public health context. I, I think you um, said on a podcast recently there was an outbreak from a hotel in Melbourne that led to 700 cases. Do I have that number right? Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? And look, th this stuff is, it's, it's, it's value judgment. It's almost philosophy rather than, than public health, you know, who, who writes versus rights of one group versus rights of another and how you balance them. And um, I, I, what I would say is what's really interesting to me is that it's a very different conversation in Ireland than it is in Australia, because once you've got to a point where you don't have community transmission, people in Australia are very, very, very fond of hotel quarantine. And whereas in Ireland, you're in a situation where you, you're not going to see the benefit of that for a while. And to be honest with you, if the other pieces of the public health puzzle aren't enacted, you're possibly not going to see a, a great deal of benefit at all. And it's all about, you know, getting people to a place where they where they feel that this all this hard yakker is is achieving something. And it, it's also born out of frustration. People just see one hard fast rule and they're worried about business and i suppose if i could use an example which maybe strays away from the question a little bit but maybe illustrates how you bring people on board with, with this type of stuff a little bit more because you've got to do this in a way that ex accepts that public health has to be balanced with the economics so anyone who has traveled to australia for any length of time as a youngster has probably spent three or four months picking fruit. So um, I don't know if people are aware, but fruit picking and citrus and stuff are worth billions upon billions upon billions to the Australian economy. And what was happening sort of last year was that there was no backpackers to pick the fruit. So tons of fruit were rotting and it was major, majorly affecting the, um, the economy. So, what 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 they did here was that they they as they do with so many industries they they came up with an industry specific plan and I keep saying to people that you can come up with these plans and do things safety do things safely if there's a real threat to your economy 
So, so to give you an example, um, aside from backpackers, the, the big group of people who come to Australia to pick fruit are people from the Pacific Islands, Tonga, Vanuatu, etc. And they, they have hotel quarantine and have no community transmission of COVID. So what happens with fruit pickers in Australia, and I've loads of them in, in my region here, and we've had no COVID in the group at all. It's worked really well. We have this sort of fruit pickers exemption. And what happens is they come in on a plane. Usually a few companies will, will charter a plane and put, put a whole stack of these guys on. Then they get shipped to on-farm quarantine. So basically, there are these massive farms in Australia. They're as, as big as the eye can see. And they get quarantined to one part of it all together. And they can go out and work the farm together, but strictly together within this bubble on the farm. And they get tested at the beginning and they get tested at the end. If they develop any uh, any symptoms, we get them tested immediately. You know, we get a doctor to go out to them or we, we, we get them tested some other way. And the long and short of it is that they quarantine on the farm and they pick the fruit on the farm and at the end of the 14 days if their test is negative and they have no symptoms they then go and work with the rest of the staff on the farm and another group comes onto the farm into the quarantine bubble and we've had a few thousand um seasonal fruit pickers come in under that scheme you know and that that works really well so i you know i often hear we have we have a few different sort of schemes like that running you know and we've, we've long had different schemes for people, truck drivers bringing in essential goods and stuff like that. And, and you, you have this constant sort of refrain from overseas that Australia is just stuck in this rigid system when actually an awful lot of our time is spent with working with individual industries, looking at safe ways to do things and mitigating some of these problems, like using trailer drops and stuff like that, you know. So you, you can be, when, when, when you have a real threat to the economy, you can be inventive. You know, you've got to be safe. And we have had zero um, leakages, for want of a better word, from the, 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 the fruit picker um, scheme. You know, so you, you can do this. You, you couldn't do it for every industry. You know, there has to be a limit on it. I mean, quarantine is quarantine. As Gabriel says, you can't have half a quarantine. You know, you've got to do it properly. But there are times when that balance versus the risks tilts a little bit in the opposite direction when you put an entire industry at risk. And sometimes these fruit picking industries employ whole towns, you know, so uh, you can have a little bit of uh, a little bit of flexibility is all I'm trying to say within what you do, as long as you do it safely and it's well resourced. We have a lot of people working around these systems. Thanks, Niall. I think that's a really interesting uh, point to end on because what we've seen a lot here in the discussion has been um, people coming up with problems, but nobody willing to come up with solutions. And so that's a very good example of how you can just have a practical mindset and come up with tailored solutions. And you mentioned earlier the compassionate grounds for special arrangements for the quarantine as well. And so um, the discussion here has really been people saying, oh, it won't work for this reason, it won't work for this reason. And what do you do about the truckers? And you know, these are all practical problems that just require logistical um, solutions for somebody with a creative mind and a little bit of ingenuity. And it's great to see how much of that you have done. I mean, you're so far ahead of us in Australia because you took the step of actually implementing this and ironing out all of those creases and figuring out the solutions to all of these difficult problems. And we're just so far behind in that regard. And um, so we're, we're having those discussions now and people are throwing their hands up and saying those, those things are reasons to not even try. So I think it's really, really valuable to hear um, how it has been done in a practical sense in Australia. It's been really useful. So I think it's a good time to wrap up because um, we've been an hour and 20 minutes and I think that's long enough. And so, as I was saying before, um, we're very grateful for Niall Conroy, uh, consultant in public health medicine in Queensland, Australia. Uh, for giving his time at a very strange time of night as well for him. So we're grateful. I don't know if it's night or day over there. I can see it's dark out the window behind you anyway. But um, we're very grateful that you've done that. And it's it's been really valuable to hear this because the discussion is very much live and ongoing here in Ireland. So it's been really great to hear about how it has been practically implemented, how it is backed up with a lot of public health resourcing and um, the integration of public health into the broader medical system and how the public health consultants are 
consulted and um, you know, brought into the decision making process so that you've had such an effective response and and the, in their day to day quality of life is so much superior to what we are currently dealing with. And so it's a really wonderful example of how this can work. And so um, we have we currently are experiencing, you know, I suppose, uh, teething problems in Ireland with, and with the with the quarantine as has been brought in. And we see that it hasn't been done totally effectively because it isn't for every country. And if the aim is to exclude uh, the variants of concern because we want to protect our vaccination program and we want to get back a good quality of life while we're waiting for the vaccination program to to be completed. Um, you know, we ought to do this more thoroughly and back it up with the proper resourcing. Finally, over a year into a public health crisis, we should be throwing resources at our public health doctors and letting them have consultant status so that they can have teams, so that they can have autonomy. We've seen how expensive this pandemic has been in Ireland. And it looks like we've spent the money in all the wrong places by uh, being too short term. We've been patching holes instead of dealing with the problem. And um, so we, if we had spent the money on public health doctors, if we had been spending it in, in um, proper quarantine systems, we could have avoided a lot of the costs we've had over the last year plus, and we would have also avoided, um, one would expect, a huge amount of death and suffering too. So this is a, a this is still important because we, we this isn't over yet, and there's still an opportunity to, um, to salvage some quality of life and also to prevent um, a lot more infection as well. So thank you to everybody for contributing to the discussion today. Thank you to everybody who's listening and um, see you next time. Thank you.